funny lecture, but it's very simple stuff. For high school geometry, if the high school was interested in classical mechanics. First, I'd like to review the phaser pair uh, production, which is shown on the right-hand screen there. Uh, second, I compare it to the Kepler anomaly projection that we uh, talked about um, as, a, as a second way to do uh, elliptical construction. And I've got a little picture of that one uh, on the left of the uh, uh, mathematical screen. The uh, idea of all of this is to introduce the idea of dual operators, dual matrix operators, in particular this case, two by two uh, matrix, to, uh, very similar to the ones that we've been looking at for bouncing walls around. The uh, quadratic form for an ellipse, this is an equation of an ellipse, uh, versus the same form except that the matrix inverse uh, it is uh, replacing the matrix itself. And Q just stands for quadratic uh, uh, in this case. Uh, the relationships between the vectors that live on that ellipse and the vectors that live on this one, the R's and the P's, actually P will stand for momentum, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. This P stands for perpendicular to something that's on this ellipse. And that is one of the key ideas of this um, elliptical construction is the uh, tangents being perpendicular, tangents of one being perpendicular to the vectors on the other. Now, uh, we're going to show how each of these operators, if applied one after the other, it makes a group. We're not going to make a fuss about the group, but we're going <clears> to <throat> look at the sequences. And these are uh, sequences that terminate on eigenvectors. So we'll see about the eigenvectors of these uh, matrices from this point of view. Uh, there's a little question of how you scale to plot the geometry of this elegant algebra. And uh, there's also a very simple vector calculus uh, explanation of the geometry that occurs uh, with these dual uh, ellipses. And the thing we're aiming at will come at the end of the lecture when I show once again the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian ellipses. And uh, we've already used them uh, a little bit in the bouncing ball uh, situation. But this is general. This is going to be something that will bug us the uh, entire course all the way through to unit 8 where it happens for relativity. The geometry that we're looking at here uh, re reappears in a very elegant fashion uh, in um, the program called Relawavity, which is connected to uh, stuff in unit 8. So the duality relations of the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian will yield us what I call the first equations, first partial differential equations of mechanics, which is going to be the topic of, of, uh, of chapter 12 of this unit, review unit one. So we're going to go all the way through much of the nitty gritty of classical mechanics in a fairly short order here before we uh, then attack it in more detail uh, in units two, three, four, five, and uh, six. Uh, a little bit of seven is going to appear in chapter 12 as well. Uh, one of the things that I do have to review, and it's something you guys have probably seen already, but uh, just what does a partial differential relation amount to, and why uh, can you get away with uh, switching the order of differentiation? of functions of two variables, or three variables, or four variables, any number of variables. So that's it. Um, what we're looking first at, as I said, was the phaser pair production with an example of dual ellipses. And um, I'll run it on this screen here. 
the dual ellipses that I'm talking about are the orbits that are going to be traced by these two phasers turning at the same rate. These two clocks are synchronous. And one of the clocks, uh, namely this one, the Y clock, is, um, as you can see from its position of its phaser relative to that one, uh, it is 15 degrees or half an hour behind on a, a 12 hour clock. And uh, that will be maintained because these two uh, phasers, this hand right here and this hand right here, which right now are making the initial conditions of position here and velocity there. And that little rectangle uh, connecting the uh, tips of each of these phaser arrows uh, is maintained throughout uh, the orbit. But the dual ellipses that I'm uh, talking about are the elliptical orbits that we're going to be following uh, uh, with this setup of 15 degree phase lag uh, of the uh, Y phaser uh, relative to the X phaser. This is the X phaser with position X and velocity X divided by its frequency omega. Same omega down here dividing velocity to Y and the position Y has been turned up so its projection goes uh, to give the Y and this projection gives the X in the uh, coordinate space. And uh, one of the things I should make notice is this is really a beautiful coordinate system. It's, it's a, a pincushion Cartesian coordinate system might be the best name for uh, the crossbars in there that are the intersections of each of these ellipses associated with uh, a phase lag of 15 degrees, 30 degrees, 45, 60, 75, 90, and so forth that make up the orbits uh, that uh, are all on top of each other here uh, in the coordinate space. A similar arrangement of orbits is occurring up here. But the orbit that this one makes down here, uh, this orbit right here, is just this orbit turned by 90 degrees. That's an example of dual ellipses that comes up in the coordinate thing. All right, and so as I march through this, let me get out of the way here and go from 11 o'clock for that um, uh, phaser up there and 10.30 for this phaser, one click to 12 o'clock, that's a, um, a uh, f five minute <clears throat> uh, out of a uh, uh, 60 minute uh, click there. So they both jump forward uh, by that amount and the uh, ellipse uh, was traced out uh, by that sector uh, right there and the velocity uh, part of the ellipse uh, went from there to there. I didn't draw anything in that little jump right there between those uh, two uh, points. The, sorry, that's the going forward again. So there's our initial point right there. There's the next second point that's being drawn on these ellipses. Next jump, also five minutes. Next jump, also five minutes. Each one of them has jumped uh, five minutes. The velocity is working its way around. There it is almost, almost, uh, at the, well, in fact, exactly, because this is three o'clock, exactly at the tangency point that marks the phase lag. And that's an interesting idea. So this now tells you what the phase lag uh, is in terms of the uh, elliptical uh, coordinate system. Next jump is around the loop there. Huge jump right here. This is a Kepler equal areas being swept. This thing has a very long lever arm, so it doesn't have to go very far to sweep that much area. Uh, and so forth. As we go around the bend now, there both uh, getting to be about the same speed, but of course very different directions. And then this one winds up 
uh, on a tangency point marked by 15 degrees, and so forth. So this is the world of SU2 mathematics. That's what we have here. This is uh, uh, um, the two dual ellipses associated uh, with this particular uh, solution to a degenerate U2 two-level quantum system if you want to uh, ask for an application that's much more modern than classical mechanics. But this definitely uh, is uh, classical mechanics here. Uh, the most fundamental part of it in the simplest form. Okay? Now, um, here they all are, which is what we have on that slide right there. The, um, see if I can get over here and do the Kepler anomaly projection, uh, which is designed to work in a, with a certain orientation. So all the ellipses have to be oriented uh, with respect to a coordinate system that fits your graph paper in order for this construction to be convenient. But clearly, I can do this construction at any angle provided I make sure that everything moves rigidly. So um, in order to make this construction convenient, uh, for arbitrary ellipses, you would need a, a, some sort of transparent graph paper. Uh, or it be, have the ellipse on, on some semi-transparent uh, tracing paper, and then you have a graph that you can turn underneath it in order to make uh, this uh, uh, construction uh, as easy or practical as uh, the multiple phase uh, construction. Remember, once you do this, when you're getting velocities too, we're going to see that again uh, as we discuss um, this ellipse with its um, <coughs> dragging triangle here, the right triangle being dragged uh, around, uh, uh, in, uh, in this case, uh, <coughs> with a um, uh, counter, I'm sorry, counterclockwise, right-handed uh, direction, but it could just as well be going this way. So, uh, whichever, this is the timing line uh, for the orbit, and then the orbit has to be uh, underneath that point and to the right of this point. So, once you have the major radius and the minor radius, major radius A about 2 here, uh, minor uh, radius uh, about uh, one here. Uh, once you have those circles, then things are very uh, easily uh, constructed. But um, what I want to show you today is a sequence of these, and I've drawn. I've started to draw that uh, for a case where the A is a little closer to B. And so we're making an ellipse here that doesn't have quite as much eccentricity. This term we'll define very accurately in uh, our discussions of Coulomb orbits later on. Don't need it so much for these uh, Cartesian uh, constructions. But um, I have now uh, gotten part of the uh, main ellipse uh, here, which would be at this point here. And then I'm just sort of uh, dotting along here to the next one. And you see what I'm doing here is kind of weird, like all the things in this course, is once I've produced, uh, say, this uh, point uh, of the ellipse, then I use that radius line, that, that's the actual radial line to the point on the ellipse, uh, to make the next one by simply making it be the mean anomaly and then calculating a new eccentric anomaly there. And then once I have that one, then I use my graph paper to make another uh, little shoe, you might say, a sandal with a very sharp heel and a straight instep here, and the toe is here, right? So it's toe, heel, and whatever you call uh, the top of a boot. <laughs> Forget what bridges are, whatever. What do they say when they say, pick up yourself? Bootstrap. Bootstrap, yeah. The bootstrap, the heel, and the toe of a 
of a boo, okay? It's kind of a, a clumsy boo, right? But uh, anyway, uh, I make another one, you see. And then that's the new radius uh, right there, that vector. That's where the uh, 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 particle of the orbit would, would be. Uh, and I, I just keep doing this. I, I extend it out here and make another boot, or now be looking more like a sandal. This one looks more like a beach sandal. And so on, all the way down, well, I'll never quite make it to the axis. And that's what we want to discuss, is the algebra and geometry of that. But while we're doing that, while we're doing that, we can make an upside-down boot. Turn your head to the side, <clears throat> and I've done a little bit of it over here, but what I'm interested in there uh, will be a different ellipse that uh, is here, here, you see, and then uh, I would um, actually have another point that's right here where they're, they're doing double duty, and then, and so forth, uh, I would have an ellipse that's dual to this one. So uh, there's going to be an ellipse in here that has the same shape, uh, roughly. Well, not roughly. Uh, it's supposed to be exact, but you know, these constructions are not perfect. Same shape as this one uh, intersecting it. Those are the dual ellipses uh, that uh, come out of this construction. And eventually that's going to be uh, the geometry of the Hamiltonian and Lagrangian functions. Uh, in general, it's very general relativistic quantum effect. <laughs> Classical mechanics has got to pay homage to our current reigning theory, which is quantum mechanics and relativity. If it doesn't, we need to fix something. So, uh, here's the deal on the duality from the algebraic point of view. This quadratic form made by taking two identical vectors uh, uh, in Cartesian space, the x and the y of an orbit, for example, orbital point radius r, and uh, having two numbers here, uh, which <coughs> are simply the coefficients that you have in a well-known elliptical equation. x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared is the result of putting these matrix to uh, transform this vector to a new vector, which would be 1 over a squared x and then uh, 1 over b squared y, and then the scalar product of those is exactly that. So here's the Q operator effect on a vector x, y. And we need to say some words about what that effect is in a geometrical sense. This is where you really learn uh, what operators do to things. And we're doing a spe very special kind of operator, uh, actually a symmetric operator. Q quadratic forms uh, don't work very well if you don't have a symmetric uh, matrix, just as the, uh, the bouncing um, um, driving the, the, ma the matrices that did the uh, collisions uh, don't work very well, those ma mass matrices uh, don't work very well if they are not symmetric. So um, you can do a whole so, uh, sort of weird subject where they aren't symmetric, but it is, it, 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 it's like stepping off of the boardwalk into a swamp. Um, the inverse of this generates this other ellipse called the dual ellipse. So I take the inverse of this matrix, easily done by simply inverting uh, those uh, two numbers and coming up with an equation that looks like that. That will be uh, the equation uh, of this ellipse right here. So we're going to have two ellipses that are really different things and can be uh, plotted with different scalings, but we're going to pick a scaling so that they uh, uh, correspond rather uh, nicely to each other. So this equation here, which is written out in detail here, is the dual of this one. So that, that's what we're going to work with. So you see right away that you have a Q operator that acts on R and maps you into the P space. And then you have the Q inverse that will take you back. So 
if that if those those mappings are well defined, uh, we've got something that has the same geometry uh, as Hamiltonian and Lagrangian, as we try to explain by the time we get to the end of, of this today. Now, it helps to have a picture of this. And this is the picture that um, I am plotting here to the left, and uh, we'll be showing you lots of more detailed uh, plots. The original ellipse right here with a, um, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared, having a and b uh, as uh, its major and minor uh, 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 radii. Um, it has a companion that is 90 degrees. So in order to get that, and you see the idea is that uh, uh, we can plot the p ellipse uh, in any scale we want, and all the stuff that we're talking about here pretty much uh, is going to work. Uh, especially when um, we talk later about this ellipse having to do with velocity and this ellipse having to do with P, which stands for momentum. So they, they can be scaled uh, to anything. I can uh, shrink this ellipse if I don't change its ratio down or make it bigger, uh, and it isn't going to affect uh, a lot of the geometry, most of the geometry that we're going to talk about here. So in this case, I'm going to rescale uh, by a factor that's the product of A and B. So the P ellipse x radius, and that's uh, 1 over A, inverse of the radius of the original ellipse, um, will have to be plotted at this scale factor, A times B to, times the uh, 1 over A, which just makes it BB. And then vice versa, the Y radius 1 over B, which this thing uh, has here, uh, will be plotted with a scale factor times that 1 over b, which gives you a. In other words, they switch. Okay, that's one way to scale this. Not necessarily the best way for geometry, but geometry works best if you pick the scales carefully. So what I want to do is uh, show you uh, first this norm relationship. Um, and then, then the sort of an orthogonality relationship. And I should point out that this kind of, of thinking, this duality of thinking uh, for vector spaces is extremely important for physicists. And the um, example that I would give first, if we could direct our attention uh, to uh, these little vectors that we're going to be encountering first in chapter 12, uh, so-called covariant E sub, sub J and contravariant E super J that are made by partial derivatives that are sort of inverse of each other are uh, called improperly, I think, unitary curvilinear on orthogonal, usually non-orthogonal coordinates. In other words, this is what you need to handle the uh, most pathological coordinates. Why are they called unitary? Well, it's because the idea of them is to make, and so the scalar product of them is one, if you're talking about the same dimension. And that's this idea right here. One kind of uh, vector uh, times another, it's going to always be one. So that makes it unit. So they put an A-R-Y on the end of that a long time ago, long before uh, Heisenberg and Jordan invented quantum mechanics and started using uh, the idea of the unitary group. That's a whole different um, mathematics than what we're talking about here. But physically, what would happen to the dimensions of the product? Because you could have two different quantities. You bet. So then it That's right. One of these is going to be called the tangent space. The other is going to be called the normal space in classical mechanics. Uh, so when we take the inner product, are we going to rescale those variables to make them dimensionless and then take the inner product? Like R divided by root R, some factor? They, they uh, can, can uh, be all kinds of different dimensions. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later on. 
But the other dual space that I should point out to you right now, the one that is deserving of the name unitary, are the bras and kets in quantum mechanics that make the matrix element bracket. And we're going to use that notation later on, but not until unit four, where we talk about normal modes and all this stuff comes back again. Then we use full unit, we, we, we take advantage of the complex variables and we make unitary uh, matrices uh, do work for us. So we're getting into that, but these are all real. Everything here is real, made of real numbers. Now, um, let's look at the duality uh, relation um, in uh, s s some detail. Here's the mapping, here's the scaling, and um, this inverse list is, is, is given by that. And you can see that if I have r dot q uh, dot r equal 1, then I can very easily replace the p equal uh, q dot r or um, a q minus 1 of p equal r uh, and get just p dot r equals 1. So if this thing is set up uh, like I've drawn, uh, these things will play with each other and sometimes be lined up, sometimes not be lined up, but always scalar the product of one with the other gives one. So that, that's uh, kind of a neat thing just to have uh, observed. Okay? So here is P equal Q dot R. There's R. There's P. There's our actual uh, numerical value that we get from our orbit equations or just the geometry of this diagram, okay? And you can see uh, that this, the, the P that I get uh, for this, uh, dotted with, with the uh, R vector, gives me X squared over A squared plus Y squared over B squared equal one. It gives the ellipse equation back again, okay? And before I go on, let me mention something else that we will uh, not, usually we don't get enough time for this. It's in uh, chapter, uh, sorry, unit six about rotations. But the uh, motion of a rigid body is described by a Lagrangian that is an ellipsoid in three space. It's a slight generalization of what we've got here. And the Hamiltonian is described by another ellipsoid that's sitting uh, sort of orthogonal, dual uh, to it. Okay, so um, the quadratic forms that we're working with here uh, come very handy in understanding of the weird things that rotating uh, bodies of any kind, but particularly rigid ones, are the uh, simplest ones and quite beautiful. So uh, the norm relation uh, for that, uh, I've just uh, pointed out, but also the fact that uh, it's uh, actually orthogonal to the tangent. This vector here is orthogonal uh, to the tangent. Now I'm using the, the classical mechanic notation of this being a derivative with respect to time of the uh, r of phi that is a, a, a tangent uh, to this. Just as the uh, velocity here was always tangent uh, to the uh, coordinate uh, down there. And uh, of course you had to turn it 90 degrees in order to see that, but that was uh, what was going on in this uh, uh, scenario uh, that uh, we've been uh, running a few steps of. <clears throat> so uh, that is something I'll show in the algebra of this uh, relationship uh, right here. You can see that uh, this P right here is perpendicular uh, to the R dot of uh, the tangent relationship. Uh, we've gotten the, these velocities. And of course the velocity uh, right here uh, it is going to be a coordinate uh, a quarter cycle later, you see. This right here uh, would be the same vector as this one. 
So when you're over here, um, your velocity is predicting what your coordinate's going to be in a quarter cycle. Exactly. Well, that vector, that velocity vector, is uh, perpendicular uh, to this. And P here stands for perpendicular to velocity. This vector P theta is perpendicular to the velocity. Uh, at all times, of all angles, all phases, whatever you want to call uh, this, um, the uh, motion that's uh, imagined the ability to go around ellipses. Okay? So here, here it is. There's the velocity minus a sine, b cosine. There's the other one that cancels. Okay? a cancels a. You get cosine sine for the minus sine, you get cosine sine plus sine. Okay? And, you know, when you're analyzing things like this, you play back and forth between the shape of the geometry and the actual algebra. Because, uh, you know, it's a complicated thing and you save yourself from mistakes. So, uh, the, other, the, other, the other part of it is that the velocity associated uh, with the PLX, uh, here's the uh, a, uh, P uh, uh, dot, that is a uh, tangent associated with this P, okay, which is just P with 5 plus pi over 2, we've already pointed that out uh, for all of the arithmetic that occurs for these, and uh, that will be uh, perpendicular uh, to the um, <coughs> coordinate of that moment, phi, of that phase, phi, okay? So both of these relations are true, p dot r equals zero and r dot p equals zero, okay? There are some neat ways to uh, prove that directly, but I'm going to skip that for the moment. Um, what I want to do is just start building a whole bunch of these things. Uh, by doing the heel and the instep uh, construction. So the first thing I do, I pick a slope, and I pick an easy one, one-to-one. One. So this is a 45-degree uh, uh, slope that I'm starting with, uh, with these ellipses. And I've got the ellipses already here, uh, but I could, I'll be constructing points on them again. So I start with this unit vector, a true unit vector, and then I go forward and put down a slope that is b over a. And you see, that's the thing that's, that's going on here uh, with a typical matrix. Now this matrix is the square root of our q. Our q, recall, was 1 over a squared and 1 over b squared. This one is the square root. Okay? You've got to square this thing in order to get Q. What it does is take any slope here, uh, for example, over here on the board I started with a slope that was a little bit higher. What it's going to do is multiply whatever that slope is by the ratio A over B. Okay? So originally I had a slope of uh, I should say we're going to multiply b over a because the slope, the way we're looking at it, is y over x, right? This component over that component. And now we're going to multiply it by b over a. So we're going to keep in increasing the slope by this factor. Each time we apply one of these, one of these square root matrices, okay? Square root of q. Now going the other way, Okay. It also works. If I go with R inverse, this root matrix inverse this acts on this vector, it's going to send it up this way because there's the upside down, or I should say, uh, a flipped uh, shoe or sandal or boot with its heel now here. It's uh, boot lace here and its toe in the same place as this shoe. This is very a symmetric arrangement of the two. So it, it's going to uh, um, 
increase the slope, this one is going to reduce it. The uh, R inverse matrix uh, here is going to increase the slope each time I apply uh, again. So there's the next uh, shoe that goes with the P uh, matrix. Uh, this is the next shoe going this way that goes with the Q matrix. Okay, and The action is to give another factor on the slope, B over A, now it's B squared over A squared. This one had A over B, this one's going to get another A over B to make A squared over B squared. So the effect of going from here to there is a Q matrix. That's our quadratic form, that's what it does. But this is seeing an intermediate step, uh, which is you know, um, something you should do in mathematics, is try to see if you can find roots of the things that you're doing. So um, that is going to uh, continue uh, as long as you have patience uh, to continue it. Okay? And with a roughly two to one ratio, uh, you get down pretty low pretty fast. You see, if this was two, I now have two squared, and I now have two cubed, you see, then two to the fourth, and you know how that goes very quickly, I'm making a large number. And this one making very quickly, uh, depending on how you read this thing, actually, I'm sorry, this is one half to the powers, this is two to the powers, we're making a slope, this is high slope here, and most of all, I'm used to looking at Minkowski plots, where it's the other way around. But uh, it's balanced, in this case, on either side, by inverse. Um, what's the inverse of the other? So you're going to get a vector ch change by a factor after n steps of uh, 4 to the nth if we use n of these q's, which is 2 in, of the r's. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And eventually, this series terminates on an eigenvector of the q and the um, q inverse uh, matrix. So these, uh, there's one eigenvector that's at uh, 0 and 1. Here it is. That's the y -act. Uh, you get vector or y vector with some factor, it doesn't matter what the factor is, still an eigenvector. And then this one, the one zero, horizontal. Okay? So, just wanted to show you an example of operators that, if you keep doing them, uh, go to eigenvectors. Now, that turns out to be a very important numerical technique for getting eigenvectors of quantum operators like Hamiltonians. You just simply multiply the hell out of the thing, and what you've got to end up with is the highest eigenvector of that particular matrix. Now you turn the matrix around so that it becomes lowest, you can get the ground state something. When you say highest, highest eigenvector, uh, what does it mean, like uh, corresponding to the highest eigenvalue? Of that matrix. Of that matrix, okay. Yeah, because okay. eventually it's going to grow exponentially and leave behind the, the other lesser exponentials. So you say that this is a technique to get the eigenvectors, right? So well, it certainly works for this one. But what if there is degeneracy, like, I don't, I don't know about this system, but can you just... Uh, the question of degeneracy uh, doesn't really come up here because yeah. so A is not equal to B. But if A were equal to B, you see, you'd have a little bit of a problem. You wouldn't go anywhere. So this is you just of, sit there, right? If these, if this was a circle, because A would be equal to B, and nothing would be happening between these two circles. So this is one non-degenerate system. This is a very non-degenerate case. <clears throat> two to one, roughly. Ratio. Okay. All right. So uh, this gives you. Any power of these operators will be uh, find the x and the y as eigenvectors. I start there, I don't go anywhere. I start here, I don't go anywhere. Okay, that's an interesting point uh, to work with. Now, uh, what sort of scaling should we use? And then we're looking ahead to the Lagrangian Hamiltonian. Um, the scaling that uh, is present here, I've already mentioned. 
it's the one that makes it so the dual ellipse is the same size. But um, I w uh, would prefer for many uh, applications um, that I not scale by the factor a, b, but just by b. And that way I can make the smaller uh, radius ellipse be inside the unit circle and the larger one be outside of the unit circle. So that all the vectors that I get that live on here will be in the inside and all of the other vectors associated with the original Q uh, will be on the outside, the R vectors. So the P vectors are going to live here, the R vectors are going to live here, and they're not going to get in each other's hair quite as badly. That uh, makes the geometry of some things uh, easy. So the idea is that the magnitude of R will uh, be greater than the unit circle uh, one, and the magnitude of the uh, perpendicular guy, the, uh, the dual guy, the purple guy, B stands for purple here too, uh, will be uh, less than one or equal. So uh, that's uh, a little bit useful. Uh, here we go through this uh, action of a Q matrix that generates uh, this R ellipse on a single R vector here, okay? And by that I mean uh, this vector uh, right there, okay? And I'm going to act on that vector, and when you do that with this R matrix, uh, you get something, there's a geometry of it, uh, you, 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 you move this thing over uh, to here. That, that's kind of a, um, a neat uh, sort of idea, okay? When I perform this operation, I get this, I wind up uh, right here, um, halfway between uh, the axis and uh, the unit vector. The unit vector being uh, stopping right there. Okay? So that's kind of that's sort of neat. Um, you, you can actually trace by paths uh, here what uh, various operators do. Um, but here's a, what I really want to, to show is that a symmetric matrix Q maps any vector R to a new vector P normal to the tangent to its RQR ellipse, RQR ellipse right here. And we need to see uh, that that's what's uh, going on here. So this uh, idea of normality, the, the perpendicularness of this P, this purple guy here, who lives on another ellipse and maybe coming through here, I don't care how big the thing is, Scale it any way you want. This is invariant to scale. Make R real big, or make P real big. Uh, whatever you, uh, whatever units you want to use uh, for whatever P uh, is. And the right angle uh, that I'm talking about, of course, is uh, this one right here. Okay, so that's that's uh, what I'm uh, looking at, and here's a better picture of it that right angle uh, in this case. Okay, so we've already seen that uh, is true for P no matter uh, what you scale. Okay, and then the Q inverse one, the one that actually holds P, has a tangent as well. And that tangent had better be normal to R. And you can see uh, that we're looking at uh, this, this point uh, right here. Uh, there it is, uh, right there. The tangent p dot is the unit notation we'll use for the time derivative or phase derivative of p. This vector uh, is going to um, uh, cut that one at right angles. So that that's a, a key uh, idea of all of this. Now you could really forget all of this stuff and get that result. And that's what we like to do right now. And I'd like to do it with a, a general Q. That is a Q that has um, not just unequal elements on the diagonal, but another non-zero element, and it has to be equal, in this case, symmetric, uh, be uh, off-diagonal. So this is our bilaterally symmetric uh, 
a matrix. It's made out of the sigma b times b and then sigma uh, a times um, a constant plus a unit uh, operator. Um, a plus d over 2, a minus d over 2 is um, the combination that's needed to make that using Pauli's uh, spinners that we talked about before, the little reflection operators. The, um, the quadratic form of this matrix is a bit more complicated. And um, you should uh, do the exercise that I'll be giving you uh, for this kind of situation just to show what it uh, is doing. If this matrix is what's called positive definite, that is if its eigenvalues are positive, I, I will be working with an ellipse in exactly this fashion that we have to prove. But while we're proving it, we'll also be proving it for the case where these might come out with eigenvalues of different sign. If that happens, uh, you're looking at hyperbola in two dimensions. And then it generalizes to three dimensions in just that way. But um, compare uh, the operation Q on a vector x, y, general case. I get here ax plus by. And then down here, I get bx plus dy. Now let's look at the vector derivative or gradient of this function, this quadratic form. Partial of r, that's what the gradient is. Okay? I make use of that notation uh, up here. Uh, gradient of q means partial of q with respect to vector r. Um, this sort of writing is very common in the book by John David Jackson, which I'm sure you all love dearly. <laughs> but I think uh, he's one of the first to go ahead and use this shorthand and uh, ditch the triangle. Okay? Now, I won't do similarly, but um, we really need the actual components of this thing. So I do a partial of x with respect to all of this stuff. Don't get anything for d, but I do get a 2a plus 2b y. And then I go through with a partial with respect to y. Don't get anything there because I know y. But here I get a 2b with the x left behind. And then a 2y as I take the partial with respect to y of y squared gives me that. Okay? So, uh, what you're seeing there is very similar to this, except for a factor of 2. So if I write this thing the way I am going to write it, when this is a spring matrix, a K matrix in unit 4, uh, I will have um, here a KR squared, that's a, a potential energy, uh, one half of KR squared, uh, is a potential energy for some configuration in who knows how many dimensions. Here we're just talking about two, but that generalizes very nicely. So this gradient, or partial with respect to R of this thing, is this. In other words, the partial derivative of, of, of R squared Q with respect to R is 2RQ. Well, 2Q dot R, right? And I've taken a half here, so it's just q dot r. Okay? So there you have a proof, if you realize, that the gradient is lined up with the effect of this operation. That, that's q dot r is going to give you something normal to the, el the ellipse that is normal to the tangent at that point. The gradient's going to be that way at that point, right? Parallel to this. That's your p-vector, perpendicular vector. So, as I said, you can forget all that other stuff and just remember this very important fact. that There's all kinds of stuff behind the scenes making the geometry of this work. And we'll make use of some of that uh, in due time. Okay, just to get a little bit pedantic, I'm going back here and we do still more geometrical sequences 
that come up, just to give you a, a feeling for uh, what's next. If um, the action of the, of, the, of the squirt matrix R, the square root matrix R, uh, single one, and, and the idea is to use it, and it will rotate uh, this, this vector up to the unit circle. That's what happens. Get this. Okay? Then, I do it again, and I end up where we end up before, at the p-vector. So you can, you can plot your way around this road map with these operators. You can t you're sort of like taxi cabs will take you from point to point. Of a whole family of ellipses, what we're going to have uh, in some situations later on. Okay? And of course, you can keep doing this uh, over and over again. And when you do this, you get an advantage that I think is really cool. This is a cool way to construct n normals. All you have to do is take a compass from this vector to the next one. It'll come in there, and you put a dot there, and then draw a line through that. That's your tangent, very precise way to get the tangent. The contacting tangents uh, is contact construction that leads later to contact transformations in classical mechanics. Uh, this is uh, something we'll talk about uh, in uh, uh, the uh, chapter 12 of the unit 1. Okay, well, enough of that for the time being. Now, let's uh, switch over here. Uh, just uh, go ahead and um, look at uh, the idea of the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian duality. But I need to review something that is Cal 2, a calculus 2, okay? Um, just a review of partial differential relations that classical mechanics uses without even uh, uh, saying a word. Uh, I, I think it's really important to understand uh, so-called chain rule derivatives and uh, the um, symmetry with respect to ordering of those derivatives, uh, that, and when it occurs and when it doesn't. Uh, basically, stay away from singularities, uh, you're, you're, you're good to go. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a typical Beaver Lake boathouse. I don't know if you've made any trips out to the local lakes, but um, all of the docks have roofs over them that are in very state of repair or disrepair. Um, I used to own one, and um, it was so hard to keep it up that I uh, since sold it. But um, nevertheless, I got some mathematical uh, teaching aids out of the uh, of the experience of having that uh, pain in the ass boathouse. But because uh, the lake's always going up and down, I don't know if you know uh, that. Uh, <clears throat> They depends on the Corps of Engineers letting the water out of the dam. They could do it very fast and leave you high and dry. So um, here's the idea. We've got a, a function of two variables, two dimensions, we're actually in space here, say. And the z-axis is up. And we've got a function here that is uh, has values at each of discrete points that I've picked out here, uh, points here that are out a certain length delta x, and I can, you know, change that delta x. Uh, presumably I'm going to be doing calculus, so I'll be bringing that thing down and making it very small. Uh, same with delta y, but I'm doing that independently. And I'm going to just simply uh, do the fundamental things uh, that you do with calculus. So this point here is x0, y0, then there's x1, x1 is x0 plus delta x. I haven't changed y still on this line at a particular value of y, which is that value, and so forth. I can go out and do two of them, and three and four, and so on. Uh, if my boathouse was really a big boathouse, but this one's only got uh, four sectors to it. Uh, same thing on the y side here, where I add delta y. So what I'm going to do is figure out from just this uh, nomenclature, this the stuff that's down here, um, how far uh, is the height of this support column here compared to this one? Okay, this is a support column that has z0 equal whatever the function of x0 and y0 is. 
uh, using that notation and these things, uh, I need to figure out what that one is. Okay? And then while I'm at it, I can go out this way and figure out what that one is. And then go back and say, okay, I got this high. Now I can use this line here to figure out how high this one is. And then I'm going to compare that uh, to what I get by going out this way, figuring out what that is, and then using the stuff to figure out how high that is. Okay? Now, if this point right here is contiguous with and these lines are correct and not misleading. If this thing hasn't, you know, like happened to my boat, how it's fallen down and left this one on the sink, then the partial derivatives will be symmetric. If that hasn't happened, but if it does happen, they won't be. So basically what we're trying to say is that if this point is eventually going to be part of a smooth uh, function that's continuous and differentiable, these two first and second order, I'm uh, in good shape. So that's the essence of this that you've already heard. So let's go through it, you know, pretty quick. Slope here. Now what does a partial derivative mean? It means how much does a function change if I only let the variable that's here move? Now if you're in thermodynamics, the uh, they made it easier for the engineers who had a hard time with uh, notation. Uh, they'll make it uh, easy by writing a little line here and, and listing all the variables that you kept constant. But we're grown up and we're physicists. We don't need that, right? When you see the curly guy, you mean only that one's allowed to change. I cannot move this way or that way. I can only move in the direction of the x-axis. So that, that slope, that means that you take the derivative of x with respect to x and evaluate it at x sub 0, right? And the function. And y, y sure. sub 0. Right, yes. Because it will be a function of both. You can see it's tilting in, in both directions. Okay? So there's your slope. Okay? Now, with this boathouse, we don't have to play uh, infinitesimals. Uh, I can tell you right away that this height here is equal to what you started with plus the slope times how far you went in the x direction, which is the only direction you're talking about. Right? So this is an exact result for the boat house. <laughs> right? Eventually going to be uh, part of a curved, continuous surface, but um, you get the picture. We're only going to take this to uh, first order uh, as far as the actual number. Now, over here, same deal, okay, over here, same thing, now it's the slope due to moving in the y direction that I have, a completely different number than that in general, okay, actually much less than that, this is a pretty high slope, that's pretty low slope, okay, same thing, now uh, the height of this pillar right here is given by that, okay, now it gets so messy, all right, I find the slope at this point using the same trick. I say the slope here has to be equal to the slope that I had back here, plus now I've got to do a partial with respect to x of this quantity, the slope. I have to see how much does this slope vary. You know, it looks like it varies a little bit, right? I've got to put that in, right, and multiply by delta x, okay? So that, that's how big uh, this uh, slope is at, at x1 right there, okay? That, that's the slope. And then once I have that slope and I have a starting point here, you see, I can figure out how high I am here. But let's go back and get this one uh, straightened around as well, okay? Got to find that one. Well, it's going to be uh, whatever I had at the origin here in the line of slope, plus the, now a partial derivative with respect to y, of that slope, which is a partial respect to x. So you see it's y x here, it's x y here. Okay? Well, you know the rest. There's the uh, thing we started with. There's that derivative written out, okay, in its completeness. We're talking about the uh, one that has a partial respect to y, okay? And then 
uh, we put them all together, we're going to have this plus this, and then we're going to multiply delta x uh, by this. So I, this is a term that uh, is a more complicated one. It's got a y x on partial derivative, but this one has a partial f with respect to delta x, and this one's partial f with respect to delta y. Okay? All right. Do the other one. Same thing, now we're playing with this guy here. We expand that guy, just like we did this one, except now it's backwards. But everything's the same for this and this. It, this thing right here, okay, you'll see here. This thing right here, you'll see there. They're just in a different order. I didn't mean to affect, affect anything. I can uh, just throw this away and this away, but I'm left with these two that are not necessarily the same, unless, unless this is not screwy. This thing comes up there and that one comes up there, forget it. This thing is some sort of helicoid and we're right into singularity, forget it. Don't try to flip your derivatives uh, at that point. So that's the basic idea. We've got these things here. You two, two important results coming out of this. Okay, those guys are equal, and if f, f is continuous around those two points, then you see they have to be equal. I'm getting uh, a particular result uh, that is the same uh, for both of those paths, if you will. Okay, so this is giving us a chain rule. It gives you differentials eventually. So in physics, we just we may end up using this as we keep changing the order of derivatives in our calculations. Is it because most of the time the functions are continuous everywhere? Yeah. If they're not, forget it. It's not going to work. Don't try to do it in any sort of weird singularity, like the center of a polar coordinate system or the focal points of an elliptic coordinate system. Those are all things that we'll be considering uh, in some detail. Fortunately, there aren't very many of those in the ones that we do, but more pathological situations. Goodbye, that rule. <clears throat> so the chain rule and the symmetry rule are the uh, things that are, are, are arisen uh, from uh, us being careful about boathouses. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this uh, idea, which can be written this way, or uh, uh, um, Lately, I find relativity books uh, writing little symbols like that uh, okay. uh, for partials. Also, uh, does a corresponding group exist even for the choosing the order of integration? Uh, is that That's all. That is a quite different, in some ways, uh, discussion. Uh, we'll take a look at that um, when we do ch um, chapter 10, because we'll encounter all of this with respect to uh, the complex variables, which are functions of two, two real variables, right? Com complex uh, analysis or analytic functions. We have to define what that really is. That's something that's not done very well uh, in uh, um, <clears throat> even some math courses, but certainly in the physics, uh, so-called um, applied mathematics, uh, is leaving out some really important philosophies. But uh, the um, thing that you'll find is uh, things like the Stokes theorem or Green's theorem or the generalized Stokes-Green theorems. Uh, there is a relationship between what we did with the derivatives and the integrals. Uh, the you know, path independence is, I think, what you're getting at. Path independence of integrals demands a symmetry of some derivatives. So they are related, it's just not a simple relation at all, which I uh, won't go into any more uh, here. Any other uh, questions about Cal 2, which is what we're looking at here? Okay, I think we can uh, go on. Uh, let me see, I have something else here. Oh, yes. Dot product between a gradient and dr. It's another notation for um, these things that we're talking about here. The chain rule is like that. And this is a velocity relation, chain rule. We're going to use those 
right at the beginning of a discussion that introduces Lagrange equations and Hamiltonian equations uh, in uh, chapter uh, 12. Okay, now we're almost done here today, except that the next part uh, makes use of all of this um, stuff. I'm particularly uh, interested in going through this one more time there, and then I will go ahead and uh, see if I can get the beach ball that's now spinning and uh, show some pictures of these uh, ellipses that have tangents and normals. And uh, let's remind ourselves of where we were last when we talked about of the functions of energy, functions of velocity, one half mv squared summed over, well, however many dimensions, but we're going to just deal with two. Uh, is that a key? Super that ball problem. A Lagrangian in general is a function of uh, position, velocity, and time, right? Like, are you just yes. considering a special case where it's just a function of velocity? This one is not a function of any position yet. Yeah. Okay, so it's yeah. just a special case. That you're That's right. We're, we're doing the super ball problem, okay? And uh, we turn the gravity off, right? So we don't have anything in there that might be, or we haven't attached any springs to it to have a one half k r squared, right? We're just dealing with velocity now. So velocity, uh, that when you um, <clears throat> make a connection with this stuff, uh, this r that we uh, mentioned here, the radius vector that went dual with p, now it's velocity that's going to be dual with this p. Okay? So the two things that you hear about in um, any other classical uh, mechanics book uh, <clears throat> that you might pick up randomly in the library are Lagrangian and Hamiltonian uh, being uh, explicit functions, you hear a uh, velocity and rescale velocity, which is momentum. Okay, there's a little uh, a Q matrix there. <clears throat> okay, but there's one here too. Okay, that's where it really starts. The M matrix is our Q. Okay. Now. We could just forget about this, but remember how a powerful thing this was? This is the, uh, the Atrangian, Lathrangian, whatever, uh, in honor of Albert Camus. Um, this is one step away from this, you see. I'm, I'm going to scale this thing with square root of m, one and two, respectively. Okay? So that I get an energy that has a 1 here, right? It's just a sum of squares. V1 squared plus V2 squared. Oh, don't forget the half. We didn't take that away. But we did make this go away. So uh, the Q matrix turns out to be an identity matrix because of the rescaling, right? We've rescaled the ellipse to a circle, right? Exactly. Okay? And then you do this again, and now you've got that. That's your MV that gives you momentum. Okay? So you can write the same energy either as M1V1 squared or P1 squared over M. Because P1 is simply m1 v1. And so with all of the dimensions, here only two. Uh, so I have m2 v2 uh, there. But the square root of m1 times v1 was the thing we called big v1. And by doing that and making this a unit matrix right there, the sum of squares made the geometry a ruler encompassed job with nice angles and little similarities and things like that. So we could do multiple collisions 
uh, using this uh, practically with our eyes closed. Very hard job using either one of these. Okay, if we want to do a lot of collisions, it gets messy. This does not. This makes it, it analytic as well. Okay, so as I say, I'm going to throw this one away for a while. It's going to be thrown under the bus <laughs> uh, for a while. Okay, uh, we'll pick it up uh, much later. We're doing the standard Lagrangian, the standard Hamiltonian uh, geometry. Well, we've seen a picture of that before. Okay, the M1, M2 matrix is our Q matrix. It's like our Q matrix which was a square of the R matrix, which was a squirt matrix, okay? And then Q inverse, which is our squared inverse, is uh, like uh, this matrix right here. 1 over M1 and 1 over M2 is what you use to make that a list. So we could just work with these two, but remember, this one is there being a circle. Each time you scale, and what we did here was we just do a gigantic scaling of this thing up to that, and a gigantic crunching of this one down to that. This is a more gentle scaling of this one, and a gentle crunching to just make them equal. Okay, Make them circular, or for three dimensions, spherical. Well, when you do that, all your slopes get multiplied by these matrices, right? Okay, so what was our uh, center of momentum bisector at 45 degrees in the velocity uh, collision uh, calculations that we used to uh, serve as a bisector? So we would put the point of our compass here and the lead of our compass would come around and strike an arc to that point, right? That was nice. Okay, cool. We can do uh, a lot of collisions with geometry, but it's boom, 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 boom for a very skinny ellipse. You're going to bounce a lot. Uh, it's really much nicer to do it with that. But of course, when you do it with that, the slope goes from, in this case, I've got a mass ratio of 16 to 1. Okay, if I was thinking that was going to be 1, which is a nice thing to do when you don't care about scale. So that uh, the slope, you see, uh, here, of, of minus 16 of these blue lines, the collision lines, you see, is going to get scaled. Well, first, it's going to be scaled by the square root of 16 to 4. So the slope here is minus 4. And then finally, uh, when I do one more time, I'm going to scale that sucker to 1. Right? So the thing that was, that used to be uh, at 45 degrees, which would be the perpendicular like that one where the velocity was equal. Now, uh, this is the momentum line. Okay? The momentum line is P1 plus P2 is constant. Sum of momentum is constant. That's what gives you a one-to-one -one slope uh, in the Hamiltonian geometry. Meanwhile, the bisector used to be one-to-one, -one, right? That thing is going to go to plus 1 16th, practically flat. That's the bisector, you see, of this ellipse. Uh, any of these lines here uh, get bisected by that. And that sets up your geometry uh, for the Hamiltonian. This is much nicer, okay, because this thing is perpendicular to this thing. That makes that geometry really sweet. Okay, well we've got just about five more minutes. I think I can show you a little bit of the calculus of duality. And this is absolutely bizarre and we're going to try to make sense of it uh, in the uh, next lecture, lecture 11, uh, which sets up um, why it is that various things that we're saying right now are true. But this is the um, basic uh, philosophy, almost. It's, it's, it's so weird sounding. 
that you don't even think it's right, but it is. It starts out with simple demands for explicit dependence. Call it loyalty or fealty to the colors or something patriotic, okay? Where each of these different countries here, Lagrangian country, Hamiltonian country, or Strangian country, uh, say some things about uh, their uh, quantities. For example, Lagrangian has no explicit dependence on momentum. So I am going to write that partial of L with respect to P is identically three equal bars, zero, as is the Estrangian. Estrangian does not give a hoot about momentum. Okay? Uh, in your example, the Lagrangian depends on velocity, like half mv squared. Yeah. So we can rescale it and write as p squared over 2m, right? The same thing. And then in that case, dl by dp would not be zero, because it would be. Well, you're getting a little ahead and also a little behind by that question. Um, when I say explicit dependence, that's different from eventual dependence. Because when we put these things all together, then uh, the Hamiltonian is going to change with both momentum and velocity. And Lagrangian is going to change with both velocity, which it should, and momentum, you see. They are ultimately going to have relations. But they're not explicit. This is explicit. This is the way we're going to define the thing. Now, we get really snotty about this in thermodynamics. Uh, so mathematically, what is the definition of explicit dependence in a variable? That's what we got to do next time. Okay. okay. Right now, I'm just going to state it and see what the consequences are. Okay. And see what the geometry is. A little bit. But later, we're going to uh, be very careful with this. And I can see why the other books don't discuss this. It takes a lot of scratching of head to pull this off. It doesn't look right at first. But when you get really careful about explicit, it's cool. It's a quantum mechanical effect like just about everything. It's a contact transformation like Huggins waves uh, ultimately. So we have. For L and E, no explicit dependent on momentum. For H and E, no explicit dependent on velocity. And for L and H, no explicit velocity dependence. Okay? Now, uh, I mean spidinium, which is the big V, right? There's a new quantity here. Okay? Now, thermodynamics, you play with variables all over the place, exactly like this. And so you're, for the first time, going to learn what it is that makes thermodynamics tick. They say thermodynamics is a subject that you have to learn uh, n times. <laughs> n being, depends on who you read. Okay. This will help it make it once. Now, um, such non-dependencies hold in spite under the table matrix and partial differential con connections. Okay. The actual Dif differentiation of L with respect to V, that's partial derivative of V with respect to uh, this thing, it's the Lagrangian written uh, in it's all of Scott right now, but no potential uh, yet, the schematic uh, Lagrangian that we're playing with here. Uh, but whatever else would be a function of, of a position and therefore subject to uh, zero uh, derivative with respect to V. But this comes out to M dot V equal P, which, okay, kind of know that one, right? So there's there's what your gradient of L, and I'm talking about a velocity gradient of L is, it's momentum. Hmm. Sound familiar? That's our first time and a half of our duality. Okay? Now go over to Hamiltonian, all right? Now we're looking at uh, this V here, partial H with respect to P. That's what we're uh, uh, getting here. Partial derivative with respect to P of this. This is the result that we get. The gradient with respect to P space of this Hamiltonian is velocity. That's just these uh, relations right here. That's just our gradient that we talked about. Okay? That's the, uh, you know, the animals, the uh, 
Lagrange, I call Lagrange's first equations. V gradient of L, written this way, that's a John David Jackson notation. Uh, if he were to you know, bring this up, that's the way he would write it, I guess. Uh, this is a covariant way of writing it. Hamilton's first equations. Okay? So we're at this point halfway through this course. Okay? Hamilton's equations come two forms. Partial with h with respect to p, is this one, is velocity. Now we write that q dot, coordinate dot. So that's just a, a identity. Okay? But this is an equality that's dependent on the geometry that we were looking at. Gradient p, h. Okay? Now we still have to get that other one, but our Hamiltonian isn't a function of uh, coordinates at all. We don't have any gravity turned on or potential, you see. So this one's going to be zero. Okay? I don't bother right now. Okay. Now the Lagrangian equations, okay, right here, the definition of covariant momentum, P, is the gradient of the Lagrangian, partial L respect to Q dot. Partial L respect to V. That's the definition. Right there. So, this is how we play it. Now, we could go through a whole bunch of stuff with this, but we're not going to do it. We're running out of time anyway. Okay? Here's the graphical picture. Okay? Here's the Lagrangian plot. That's tall ellipse that we did to uh, 49 uh, mass ratio on. We never really did much with this guy, but that's what he looks like. Okay, HP equal a constant is a curve in P space. Okay, that we just you know took apart a few minutes ago. This one we're supposedly familiar with. Okay, we can tell what the uh, minor axis is and what the major axis or semi-major axes are written in little tiny uh, letters there that you're familiar with. In this case, it's very similar in this case. And here's the thing that's going to happen when you overlap them. The Lagrangian tangent, remember, and that's the slope of the collision lines, okay, in this case, all right, uh, that, that thing, that thing is going to be orthogonal to the actual uh, p vector, this guy, if you overlap them. Now, it doesn't matter how big they are or how small they are, if you have less mass, then this guy is going to be big and that guy is going to be small because it's a big number in the denominator. If you have a tiny mass, you're going to get a big Hamiltonian and a little Lagrangian. But still, the orthogonality relations that we sketched here are the same. So this tangent here is going to be perpendicular to the velocity. That's the tangent at the V point. And the um, tangent at the V point is going to be perpendicular to the momentum. Okay? That P is going to be the gradient of L. It's going to be pointing this way all the time, always normal to that uh, thing. And then this one down here, the velocity is always going to be a vector pointing normal to the Hamiltonian. And that's going to be uh, all the way up through relativity. This is a relativistic quantum effect. <laughs> Based on the geometry of waves. We've been doing geometry of waves by fiddling with these ellipses here uh, in uh, our work. So I, I think um, that is it for now. We got to come back with our thinking caps on, and I would suggest you read the section so before next lecture, uh -huh. which will be quite a few days from now, which, uh, Tuesday. <laughs>